Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with my ideal list of 20th century violin concertos. Now, we need to qualify this because there are like millions of 20th century violin concertos. And as we've already done our talk on the ideal romantic violin concertos, I want to pick up where we left off. Here's the thing. I had to draw a line somewhere in terms of dates. And in this case, I drew the line at 1960. So there are a lot more 20th century violin concertos we need to talk about. But I wouldn't do them as an ideal list because what I really want to talk about are pieces that have more or less edged their way into the general repertoire. That means they have to have been recorded a certain number of times. They have to have at least a ghost of a chance of being seen in concert. They have to have some sort of general recognition as to their quality. It's, it's actually a very, very complicated question, you know, to decide which of them they are. And I feel that after 1960, we're dealing with a, a whole new crop of them that I wouldn't call repertory pieces yet. There hasn't been enough time for them to get into the repertoire. And so, and so, I mean, some of them have been recorded multiple times, but that's a different talk. It's, it's what I would call the modern violin concerto list, or at least, at least a list of concertos that I think, or that we'll talk about, that deserve to become part of the repertoire. And so that we'll, we'll, we'll put off for now. Right now, I want to talk about those works which basically are in the repertoire, are certainly worth hearing, that are, are really beautiful works that don't get a lot of attention and that really deserve to get more attention. <laughs> I think than they do. I mean, these aren't all these aren't all pieces that don't get a lot of attention. Some of them have. Some of them really do. Some of them are acknowledged masterpieces, but I've stuck a few in here that I also think deserve greater acclaim than they've received to date. And they all fit into this basic period from around 1910-ish to 1960, about 50 years. One of the things that's so remarkable about this period, as I said before, is that, you know, the 19th century, the number of great romantic violin concertos, even though there were lots of violin concertos written, is very, very small. But just as the, the golden age of orchestral writing happened from about the 1890s on, the same thing happened with violin concertos. It's really a very, very interesting phenomenon. There are more good violin concertos written after the turn of the 20th century than were written before. Part of the reason is because, is because they were all written by major composers for other violinists. They weren't written by violinist composers. That is, composers who were principally violinists and composers second. And so they wrote a lot of trashy violin music for themselves to play. The idea of writing a violin concerto for another soloist and the demand for repertoire from great violinists for great concertos is a very, very new thing. It, it happened rather later than the same situation with piano concertos. Also, also because most composers were keyboard players first and foremost and not violinists, there were always fewer violin concertos that were being composed. But the 20th century, composers finally sort of sucked up their pride and talked to actual violinists and wrote pieces for violinists and consulted them on how to properly write concerto-style music for the violin. And the result has been a, an explosion of really fine violin concertos by a very large number of composers. And so it's very exciting to, to talk to you about this because it really is, historically speaking, a fairly recent phenomenon, one that isn't really acknowledged or spoken of. I mean, for those who are of a scholarly bent, there's a serious paper in there about the, the growth of the violin concerto. And it tells us also in violin concertos, almost more than any other bit of the orchestral medium, that there really was great music being written, great classical music being written that's contemporary. And because these are really among the best concertos for the violin. It's kind of amazing. So I have something like 15 of them here, which is a pretty good number. And 
Let's talk about them. And then if you want to give me your list, you can give me your list or you could toss in one that you think I left out. I mean, there's some that I just decided not to include, like the Cachaturian, because I think it's awful. But most of the, I think, major ones are here. And there will be a couple that uh, maybe you didn't expect. So here goes. First, I'm picking up exactly where we left off with the idealist of romantic concertos. You may recall that we ended with Sibelius, which was composed in the early years of the 20th century, like 1905-ish around there. Now we're jumping up just a few years to what I call the 20th century. And, you know, it's no point in making a, a production about the actual dates. I just think that we've we've made reasonable demarcations based on the music, which is what I try to make my my guiding my guiding effort in all of these. That's the thing that matters. So the first great violin concerto of the 20th century, in my view, or one of them, was Elgar's. I mean, now, the Elgar concerto is the longest violin concerto in the general repertoire. It's a remarkable piece of music. It really is, and a very great one. And it hasn't quite penetrated into the repertoire as I think it should. I mean, some of these have. The problem with it is that it's the longest violin concerto in the entire regular repertoire. It lasts a good 50 minutes in most performances, and sometimes more than that. That makes it, first of all, just a beast to play, number one. But number two, it really has to have a half of a concert all to itself. And there aren't that many soloists who are going to draw in an audience that way. Usually the concerto is like half an hour, 35 minutes, maybe max, 20 minutes, and it goes on the first half of the program before the big symphony. So it's a special piece. It remains a special piece. Of course, it's a, a, a specialty of English violinists and English orchestras and conductors. And the performance I chose, which you may have seen here, is not perhaps the most, the most well-known, but it's sure one of the best. Hugh Bean with Sir Charles Groves and his Royal Liverpool Philharmonic on EMI. Now, this is still around. It's in the, the EMI's sort of Elgar collection or Warner, whatever it is now, the big box. And it's also in the Charles Groves box. And I wanted to give it a shout out because, first of all, it's just a magnificent performance. And, you know, the problem with this concerto is, is that it's so long and it tends to bog down, particularly in the finale. And this one does not. And that's why I like it so much. I mean, Groves had rhythm. <laughs> you know, he keeps the thing moving. And, and Hugh Bean is a wonderful soloist who knows and clearly loves the music. And they, they turn in a performance that, that's both con amore, if you want to call it like that, you know, with, with love, but that doesn't dawdle and doesn't slobber <laughs> and that doesn't, doesn't make the thing a, a chore. So the Elgar Concerto, that's definitely a major one. Next, from almost exactly the same period, within like a year or so, is the Nielsen Concerto. Now, the Nielsen is the great 20th century Scandinavian violin concerto that nobody ever remembers. And the reason for that is really very, very sad. It's because it sounds, first of all, more like Nielsen than it sounds like a violin concerto, which is great. It's what you want. You want a, a concerto to sound like the composer and not so much like, like you know, that it was just any old thing written for a flashy violinist. But the real reason the piece is never quite taken off is because the finale is resolutely unvirtuosic. Like most of Nielsen's music, it follows an emotional trajectory. And that emotional trajectory is full of, of fabulous music and extraordinarily well realized and beautifully structured in a very original sort of two movement type form. But that emotional trajectory, however satisfying it may be musically, sort of is does not comport with what we expect violin concertos to do, which is give the soloist something dazzling to do at the end. This finale is relaxed, it's amiable, it doesn't have a soft ending, that would be the real kiss of death, but it, 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 it doesn't dazzle as you think a romantic violin concerto ought to, or one written in that style. And for that reason, the piece is kind of cursed, but it's such a beautiful work. I mean, it's a great work of Nielsen, and that's why I love it. 
And if you like Nielsen, you will love his violin concerto. This is, is uh, Cho Lang Lin with the Swedish Radio Symphony at Esapekka Salonen on Sony. It's coupled with the Sibelius. And I have to tell you something about couplings, too. Um, it's sort of an important point here. Usually, I try and do different violinists for every concerto. I haven't done that here. It's not really sensible. And the reason it isn't is because most of these composers only wrote a single violin concerto. There are some exceptions that we'll get to, but most of them wrote one violin concerto, and that violin concerto, because it's of modest length, will either be coupled with more music by the same composer or another 20th century violin concerto. And I am not going to make myself and you crazy to picking out duplicate recordings of, of pieces to have separate violinists, because you're going to wind up with duplicates anyway. I mean, if, for example, well, we'll, you'll, see, you'll see how it works out. If you pick the Korngold Concerto, you're going to get Concerto Y by another composer. And then you have to pick one by that other composer to have a different violinist. But we've already done it. So what's the point? You know, I'm not going to worry about it. And if you prepare a list, don't worry about it. Just, just put in a... <laughs> whoops. I got a little too enthusiastic there. Just put in whoever you want to put in. And it'll all be fine. It'll be perfectly fine. Okay, so after the Nielsen Concerto, here's one of my sleeper concertos that really deserves tremendously more play than it gets. Ernest Bloch. Now, Bloch, as you know, was a great composer of orchestral music. This violin concerto is sort of one of his kind of quasi-Jewish works. That is, it has a, a sort of Asian faux oriental cast to some of the melodies. Um, or they sometimes sound like Western music, American Western music. It doesn't matter. This is a big, bold, gushing, beautiful concerto. The only problem with it is that it tends not to move very quickly if you don't perform it. I mean, it's, a, it's about the performance. You need to give it energy and juice and keep it going. And if you do that, it's going to be absolutely magnificent. And it really is here. This is with, with Ola Krisa and... Sakari Oromo, I mean, when he was like 10, <laughs> um, he's conducting the Malmo Symphony Orchestra on BIS. It's a gorgeous performance. It's available. Uh, this piece can be a little hard to find, but it's been recorded many times. It really has. I mean, there's a famous old recording with Zagetti. I mean, the piece is a gorgeous, gorgeous violin concerto that deserves to stay in the repertoire. So Ernest Bloch, give it a shot if you haven't. It's absolutely beautiful. And Bloch wrote a lot of really good music for violin and orchestra. He was a wonderful composer for stringed instruments generally. So I don't know. Like most of his music, it seems to be out of favor now. It deserves not to be. But here are two that have never been out of favor. And I'm talking about Berg. <clears throat> and in this case, Stravinsky. This is the classic Perlman Azawa recording. You also get Ravel's Sigana, blech, blech, Ravel's worst piece of music, but that doesn't matter. Um, you know, the Berg, of course, is one of the iconic 20th century works for violin and orchestra, and it's going to be the subject of a talk all by itself rather soon. Don't worry. And uh, the Stravinsky, of course, is another absolute classic, and this is a great coupling. Absolutely great coupling. Perlman is fantastic in this music. Azawa is an ideal interpreter for Stravinsky and Berg. He does modern music so well with, with such clarity and finesse and elegance. And you've got the Boston Symphony and there is nothing not to love. The disc is a classic. It always has been. I saw in the comments somebody sort of sneered, sneered at it for some reason. I have no idea why. Don't listen to anyone who tells you otherwise, you know. There are just some great performances out there that have been acclaimed and deserve the acclaim, and there will always be naysayers, and we should ignore them, unless it's me, in which case you should pay very close attention. So after Stravinsky and Berg, we get Bartok. Now, the Bartok first concerto, I, I dislike that piece. Oh, gosh, I think it's just irritating. It's in two movements. Bartok didn't like it. He, he cut it in half. He made the first movement. Uh, a separate a separate component of another piece, the two portraits, one ideal, one grotesque. It's the ideal one. I think a lot of work is just sort of chromatic sludge, and it's never really entered the repertoire. So, so the Bartok concerto we're talking about is the second, number two, 
which has been rec recorded wonderfully many times. Um, I also have a problem with that work. Me personally, I, I think it's rather dry. I, I, I can't quite explain why and kind of bony and not as interesting as some of Bartok's other concertos and late works. It's wonderfully written. I, I acknowledge its mastery as a composition, but it doesn't, it doesn't hit me. But I still have to mention it. You may feel very, very differently about it. It has been wonderfully recorded numerous times. But I chose also a bit of a sleeper here because I think that uh, this is just a great, a great disc. Thomas Zayetmeyer with Yvonne Fischer and the Budapest Festival Orchestra. Boy, this is back in the early days of the Budapest Festival Orchestra. It's on Berlin Classics, but it's a great Elgar Second Concerto. It really is. I mean, I may not find the work all that thrilling, but I know a great performance when I hear one. And this is a great performance. So the Bartok Second, we definitely have to include in our list. It seems not to be as popular as it once was, but there are a couple of those that are like that. Let's now talk about Prokofiev. Now, Prokofiev wrote two concertos. Sometimes they come coupled on a disc. The second is vastly more popular than the first, but I have chosen a violinist who does them both and does them very well. And I think it has to be David Oistrock. This is the big Oistrock box. You may still be able to get them separately, but Oistrock, of course, is to the manner born. He has an affinity for the music that's marvelous. His Prokofiev first concerto is astoundingly great. The second is magnificent, but there are many, many, many fine performances in the second. In fact, I think we're going to run into another one here because, like I said, it's unavoidable with the mixing and matching that we're doing. But the Prokofiev concertos are absolutely wonderful. And again, they seem to be a little underrated these days. I don't know. I haven't seen performances of them that frequently, but wow, are they, are they lovely and fun to hear. Magnificently done. And David Oistrock is your guy for those. Next, ah, here's a concerto that's hovering. And I mean hovering on the fringes of the repertoire. Hindemith. Hindemith. Now, Hindemith's big, Hindemith wrote a bunch of violin concertos, you know, as part of the Kammermusik series and, you know, in other sort of contexts. But the, the big sort of romantic violin concerto was just called the Hindemith Violin Concerto. It was also recorded a lot in the, in the 60s and 50s and 60s. And then it seems to have trailed off. It may be falling out of favor, although there's a good recording on Shandos that's not too old. My recording, my, my recording of choice is Isaac Stern with Leonard Bernstein. This is coupled with Nielsen's flute and clarinet concerti, that ridiculous royal edition with watercolors by the Prince of Wales. <laughs> anyway, there's the watercolor. But the Hindemith Violin Concerto is a wonderful, wonderful work, and it deserves to return to favor if it has indeed fallen out. I'm not sure how many violinists include it in their repertoire now, but at one point, it was a major 20th century violin concerto. It received a lot of recorded attention, and it deserves to again, as far as I'm concerned. First class music and colorful and, and fun to listen to. It really is. And I, I think that uh, if you don't know this, you're in for a treat. You'll, 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 you'll find it very enjoyable. It's, it's got some good tunes in it. It's typically Hindemithy, you know, and, and it's sort of, you know, I don't know what to call it, sort of like band-like music orchestration sometimes, but it's a good piece, a very, very good piece that did not deserve the disfavor in which it seems to dwell. So Isaac Stern and Leonard Bernstein in the Hindemith Violin Concerto. Okay, next, we're going back to the good old UK. We have to talk about the Walton Concerto. And it's coupling, usually, which is the Britain Concerto. You get them both. And I have chosen, this is Maxim Vengerov. Remember him? And Rostropovich with the LSO. You get Britain and Walton. Now, the Walton Concerto, again, it had its 15 minutes of fame. It was written for Heifetz. He recorded it brilliantly. And it, it still gets a lot of play on disc. And I assume it gets performed in the UK. The Britain Concerto is much less popular than the Walton. I happen to think it's probably the better piece of the two. Qua music, it ends quietly. Big mistake. 
It ends quietly. I think only the Berg really gets away with that quiet ending. You know, it works really, really well. I think that says something about the mastery and the magnificence of the Berg concerto. The Britain, the Britain doesn't get played very often. It has been recorded very frequently, again, by English violinists and English orchestras. I mean, the British do well by their, their native sons, generally speaking, right? But it, it deserves to be popular. It's a beautiful work. The Walton is a great work. It's his, it's his well, maybe the viola concerto is his best concerto. I don't know. But I think the violin concerto is wonderful. And Vingaroff, what happened to Vingaroff, you know? He was a Teldec artist. He made it, there's a box of his stuff out. Fabulous violinist, absolutely fabulous violinist. And for some reason, for some reason, he seems to have fallen off the map when the major labels imploded and they just cut all their rosters back to nothing. Fortunately, he made a bunch of really fine recordings. And this one, Britain and Walton, is one of them. So you have to include both concertos in your list of great 20th century concertos. And this is a great recording of them. It's really very handy. <laughs> I mean, it's really incredibly convenient. Next, Shostakovich. <laughs> now, Shostakovich wrote two violin concertos, but the second comes from 1967. So it's not going to be in our list. Also, um, it has, you may get it, you may get a, a disc that has the first and the second together, but they tend to be separated. The first is vastly more popular than the second. Um, it's probably the greater work. I think it really is if we have to, that doesn't mean the second's bad. It isn't. It was Shostakovich's last concerto, though, and it's part of that spare, late, kind of creepy style that he had at that point, um, although it has a rousing ending and a zippy finale, which is really quite good. But the first concerto is, as everybody is willing to admit, a shattering masterpiece, one of the great, great, great violin concertos of any period. Really, it's magnificent. And again, I've gone a little bit off the beaten path here to leave room for you to pick all of the obvious ones, like, you know, Oyster Rock and Metropolis, and, you know, some of these other guys. Vadim Repin, Remember him? <laughs> he was kind of like Vengerov. He was another one of those Russian guys who made a bunch of recordings um, during the heyday of the, the CD explosion and then seems to have gone poof. I mean, I assume he's still out and about somewhere. He's not making records regularly. But this is a great performance with Kent Nagano, the Halle Orchestra on Erato, and it's coupled with the Prokofiev Second. This is what happens with all these violin concertos. They all get mixed and matched. I mean, Vengerov, he did both Prokofiev concertos, but he didn't couple them together. He coupled them with Shostakovich concertos. That's how it tends to work in these circumstances. So for the Shostakovich concerto, I'm suggesting Vadim Repin, if you can find him. But, oh, there's so many other great ones. I mean, there's Oistrock, there's Molova, there's, there's, I could just, I could keep going and going and going. It's such a great piece of music. My God, it's a great piece of music. So, you know, take your pick, have a good time. Just listen to the thing. Boy, that central passacaglia, the slow movement, is without question one of the most noble and majestic and transfiguring pieces of music ever written for the solo violin. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. But the whole work is that way. It's simply marvelous. So get your Shostakovich Violin Concerto. Next, here's another twofer. Twofer, Barbara Korngold. They actually go rather well together. Both people, you know, some people might regard them as sort of, you know, schlocky, you know, faux romantic, you know, pieces of kind of film music. Of course, the Korngold is film music. It's based on his music from The Prince and the Pauper and Another Dawn and a whole bunch of other movie scores. Not that it matters. It doesn't. The Korngold has made a huge comeback because romantic music and tonal music has made a huge comeback. comeback. And now people love it as they should. It's gorgeous. And The Barber is a great work too. I don't care what anyone says. You know, you don't knock something because it's tuneful and gorgeous. I mean, that's just stupid. I'm telling you right now, all of you, you know, ascetic, uh, you know, the ascetic modern music, you know, monkish sufferers, you know, just because a composer writes a tune, the fact is the violin is a melody instrument. It's suited to tunes. Barbara wrote great tunes for it. And it's a fabulous, 
fabulous piece of music. And these are fabulous performances with Gil Shaham and Andre Previn. Absolutely fabulous in both works. Uh, they're, they're magnificent. And both of them have been now recorded so frequently that you have, have no problem finding them together or separately with other things. I mean, there's just no, no difficulty at all. Of course, the classic Barber was the Stern and Bernstein, which is wonderful. I always liked the Omar Oliveira with Slatkin on EMI. That's wonderful. And Korngold, ah, it was written for Heifetz. He recorded it. He recorded it fabulously. The sonics aren't so hot. It was a mono recording, but, you know, it's it's a fantastic performance, of course. And just about every other violinist worth his salt has been doing it. And particularly nice is the fact that young violinists do it now. I mean, Perlman did it, but I would go for this. I would go for it for Gil Shaham. He's such a terrific violinist. And this recording is one of his very, very best. Absolutely beautiful. So Barber and Korngold. Finally, last but not least, by any measure, this may also come as a bit of a surprise to you, but it's one of the great 20th century violin concertos. And that is Bernstein's Serenade after Plato's Symposium. I mean, he didn't call it a violin concerto, but it's a violin concerto. It's in five movements. It has all the things a violin concerto has. It's brilliantly written, really wonderfully written. Bernstein had a characteristic concerto scoring, which was strings, harp, and percussion, which is fabulous. He used it for the three meditations for mass, for the cello, and also for halil, for flute and orchestra. It's a perfect medium in which to write concertos because because it has lots of color and it's capable of lots of energy and rhythm and excitement but it it never overwhelms the soloist it's such a smart way to write a concerto and deal with the the issues of balance of forces and the symposium the serenade after the symposium is just a gorgeous work it's one of bernstein's out and out masterpieces and it's very popular it gets performed regularly. Um, it's been recorded many, many times. It's really in the repertoire. It's in the modern repertoire. And I think it has to be on any short list of eight, of any short list of eight, no, any short list of great 20th century violin concertos. So I chose Gideon Kramer with Bernstein is my pick, but you could pick Isaac Stern with Bernstein twice, and then maybe a dozen others, all of which are very, very good. I'm so happy that this work has entered the repertoire because it deserves to. It cements Bernstein's reputation as a first-class composer, which he really was. And I think that, uh, you know, it makes a wonderful way, since it was composed in 1954, to, to end this survey of great 20th century violin concertos that are in the repertoire and that were composed before 1960. That's, that's sort of the sensible, I think, way to group these pieces together. And I hope you agree. And we'll talk about the later ones in, a, in another talk. There'll be another talk at some point. If there isn't already, since if you're watching this in the year 3,471, then you can go find that other talk. It's already been done. Um, but uh, until then, keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed this chat. Bye-bye.